So, welcome back to our webinar series on FRG. Today, we start discussing another vital area of your syllabus curricula and this has been commonly tested in your past papers. If you will become mastery of this area, I am pretty sure that you can at least grab 5 marks and this 5 marks will be guaranteed. So, you need to watch this video from the beginning to the end carefully. So, what am I talking about today? This is uh, SLFRS for SME. So, what do st SME stand for? SME stands for small and medium enterprises. Maybe most of you all would have heard about this before or maybe you all are listening and hearing this for the first time in your life. This is going to be another accounting standard, but it is little indifferent from the others accounting standard we have been learning. So, what makes it look different? I must tell you something. Small and medium enterprises. Now, Nowhere can you see a universally accepted definition for small and medium enterprise. It is only just that we can characterize a small and medium enterprises. The way this standard has characterized small and medium enterprises, but there is no universally accepted and well defined interpretations to know what SMEs are, what small and medium enterprises are. From the characters only we identify what small and medium enterprises. I will give you the characteristics in a little while. Now, you know sometimes some business organizations will be small in terms of their volumes of transactions. Some business enterprises will be small and tiny in terms of financial reporting requirements. And some business enterprises may be small, may be in a small scale, in a small magnitude or it will be a small enterprise in terms of the financing structures. And most of the businesses in Sri Lanka are family owned and owner managed business enterprises. So, there is one particular party or just group of people, maybe the family members themselves or maybe group of friends and they are known to each other for a long time. So, they themselves thought of starting a business and they, they themselves manage the business, they themselves share the profits and losses, they themselves share and take over ups and downs in the businesses. Everything is done by a group of people or just, an, just a single individual. So, as a result, the requirement of financial reporting is not as much as the financial reporting for big enterprises. What do, we, what do I mean by big enterprises? Maybe the listed company. I will come to the point uh, straight uh, after giving you a small uh, briefing as to what SMEs are. Now, we are learning SLFRSs and LKSs multiple number of uh, financial reporting standards starting from you know SLFRS 1 right up to SLFRS 16 nowadays and starting from LKS 1 right up to LKS 41 nowadays and you start learning if fricks and six and so on and so forth many things and many stuffs we learn and you talk about deferred taxes you talk about financial financial reporting a high inflation economy you talk about translating foreign operations into the presentation currency, you talk about amortized cost and you talk about effective interest rate, you talk about research and development cost. Sometimes this entire technical jargon which we are used to may be so understand, may not be so understandable to certain business community. And also <coughs> this level of financial reporting required by this financial reporting standards will not be the requirement to certain business community. Now, say if you take a simple example, Ramani was in her school 
and almost everyone in the class was so passionate about being a doctor, was so passionate about an engineer, so passionate about being a lawyer or an accountant. So, they have their target set in their life. And Ramani was a girl, she was little indifferent and almost all the teachers had cornered this girl from the class because she did not have any desire of being an engineer or a doctor or an accountant and she did not seem to have any sign of being prosperous or progress to progress in her life. And she had some interest in some other areas, she had desires in some other areas and fields and she used to have some kind of fascinating, elegant and gorgeous hairstyles and that is where her interest was. Now, sometimes she used to have a layered hair and that was cascading down to the ground like a waterfall and she used to have colored nails pointed and she used to have couple of tugs on her ear and she used to look beautiful and pretty always and she used to, she wanted always to make impressions in the minds of others on her beauty and the look. And when everybody started proceeding to A level classes just to succeed their life and she just dropped out of school and she just thought of starting a salon and running the salon. And you need to do what you love and you need to love what you do and this is what she started doing now. And she was doing pretty well, her salon became so popular, she started developing a very solid and st st strong customer base and her name, the business name became known to almost everyone. And now she has succeeded when the others were striving to succeed in A level class. Now she has to submit uh, tax returns to the department, she has to pay taxes and she has to get her financial statements audited, she has to get someone else to prepare the financial statements and come on these things and these language taxation defer tax amortized cost fair value through profit and loss fair value through other comprehensive income income other comprehensive income equity net assets the balance sheets the profit and loss she does not know any damn thing and now she has to prepare she has to do all of them but uh, accounting understanding understanding on financial accounting, understanding on taxation was very minimal. So, she has to get someone else to do all of them for her. Now, she has to apply for a bank loan to expand her salon into other geographical areas and the bank is also asking the same thing, the profit and loss and the profitability and the budgets and the forecast and the cash flows. So, what nonsense, she does not know anything about it, head or tail. Now, you need not to make the life of some people harder by making them require for them to prepare complicated set of financial statements and you need to make their life so easier. And this financial reporting should not be a barricade or should not be a hindrance, should not be an impediment for them to progress in their life and it has to be the financial reporting should be a support without it being resistant in progressing in their life and their businesses. So, now you need not to apply the entire set of financial reporting standards for a small business, business like Ramani's. Instead, we have another simplified version of the accounting standards to be applied for businesses like Ramani's and that is what we are going to learn. We learn this full set of SLFRSs and LKSs for set of businesses which we can call them specified business or businesses and for the smaller business enterprises or medium scale business enterprises without you applying the same set of SLFRSs, same set of LKSs, we have a simplified version of SLFRS to be applied in 
in financial reporting of small and medium scale business enterprises. And that is what we are going to learn under this particular topic SLFR is for SME. I hope you got the point and this is the requirement. Now, what is an SME? And you need to find the answers for the question of as to what an SME is and let me explain that part. Now, as I said before, <coughs> nobody can ever think of a universally accepted definition, proper definitions to explain in a nutshell as to what an SME is. Instead, we have the characteristics to identify SMEs, characteristics. Now, let us get on to the SLFRS for SME, but before that I must tell you something. This is a standalone standard and this is an isolated one. This is a separate one, it does not carry a number even. There is no particular, there is no number as such in particular. Like LK 16 property plant and SLFR is 16 leases, it does not carry a number as such. So, how do we identify the standard from the name SLFR is for SME? So, that is how you identify that and that is how you need to remember it. But this standard, you know, you can take it to the exam hall. Normally, the SLFRS for SME keeps being revised once in three years' time, but the latest revisions and the latest version we have for the time being is the revision done in 2050. So, that is what you need to take to exam also this time 2021 July. Another revision is imminent, and let us see, we will keep the cr fingers crossed, and there will be an imminent revision of SLFRS for SM is very soon. So, till then this is the latest one we need to take to the exam hall. Now, how do we identify an SME? Let me take you through to the definition You can have the standard book with you. Description of small and medium sized entities. Small and medium sized entities are entities that do not have public accountability and publish general purpose financial statements for external users. And that is the definition you need to remember, you need not to buy heart, you can take the standard book to the exam hall. The, your, yours is an open book exam. Small and medium sized entities are entities that do not have public accountability. Now, just to give you a simple example, if just 3, 4 people got together to form a private limited company and this private limited company apparently does not have public accountability. They will prepare a set of accounts like profit and loss and the balance sheet and the cash flows just for the sake of preparing and it is for themselves and they need not to show it to anyone else other than it being shown to the Inland Revenue Department for tax purposes or it being shown to the bank, bank just to get a loan facility. Other than that requirement, I mean this particular company or the shareholders, the stakeholders do not have any other sophisticated financial requ reporting requirements. So, it is done for themselves, they prepare the set of accounts for themselves, not for anyone else. They do not have public accountability. So, this private limited, let us say alpha private limited can be considered to be an SME, why? It is simply because of the fact that it does not have public accountability. But if you think of Beta PLC, public listed company and how has this company raised their capital mostly by inviting the general public to subscribe to their share capital and just by preparing a set of accounts for the major shareholders is not adequate and they need to prepare a set of accounts for 
almost everyone who has even subscribed to a, to a single share of the company. So, this company is said to have the public accountability. So, this beta PLC, a listed company, cannot fall into the category of SME. So, this standard SLFRS for SME does not apply for the entities that have public accountability. So, SLFRS for SME applies only for the entities, small and medium enterprises that do not have public accountability. So, how do we identify an SME simply an entity that does not have public accountability has to fall under this definition of SME. A small and medium sized entities are entities that do not have public accountability and publish general purpose financial statements for external users do not publish general purpose financial statements for external users. Examples of external users include owners who are not involved in managing the business, existing and potential creditors and credit rating agencies. An entity has public accountability if its debt or equity instruments are traded in public market or it is in the process of issuing such instruments for trading in a public market, a domestic or foreign ex stock exchange or an over the counter market including local and regional markets or it holds assets in a fiduciary capacity for a broad group of outsiders as one of its primary business, most banks, credit unions, insurance companies, securities, brokers, dealers, mutual funds and investment banks would meet this second criteria. Now, you know, if I move on to the second criteria B in this definitions of public accountability, sometimes certain businesses, certain entities will hold assets in a fiduciary capacity. What does it say? Now, we will think of a bank and just forget about their share capital and the structure of share capital for the time being. And this company has taken over deposits of 10 billion rupees from various customers. So, how does this bank raise funds to lend money to their various customers? It is by receiving deposits from various customers on the other hand. Now, the bank has to prepare or bank has to be accountable to the customers who deposited their money in this bank. Why this bank is holding the assets that belong to the customers in a fiduciary capacity. So, for each and every customer if they are interested in has to receive a set of accounts to know what this business is, where it stands and how protective their assets are under the custody of the bank. So, the bank is keeping under their lock and key the assets that belong to someone else. So, the bank has to give the maximum protections and to the safety of the assets that belong to the customers. And the customers have kept their utmost faith in the bank and that is why they have kept their money in the lock and key of the bank. So, the bank, whether it is not a listed company, we will just forget about it for the moment. Even though the bank is not a listed company, the bank cannot be taken, I mean the bank has to be, the bank cannot be taken as a small and medium enterprises because it has the public accountability. If a customer is requesting the financial statement from the bank, the bank cannot reject it, the bank has to give it why the bank has the public accountability. So, by and large, any entity that has the public accountability never falls within this criteria and the definitions of being a small and medium enterprises. So, any entity that does not have the public accountability will fall within this definitions and the criteria of being a small and medium business enterprises. So, how do we identify an entity that has the public accountability basically, if an entity has listed 
they are debtor equity instruments in a public market or they are trading the equity instruments or debt instruments in the public market. Or the second category, if an entity is holding assets in a fiduciary capacity and then they do not fall into the category of being an SME, then this standard does not apply. I hope it was clear. And then let me get back to the previous page of the standard, where some companies are listed and this standard specifically says the companies or the entities listed below will not fall into the category of SME. Let me go through that for you all. Following companies categorized under the section 5 of the Sri Lanka Accounting and Auditing Standard Act number 15 of 1995 will not fall under the definition of SME as per the standard. So, you can see it for yourself, but let me go through companies licensed under the Banking Act number 30 of 1988 cannot be an SME. So, SLFR for SME does not apply for that kind of enterprises. Companies authorized under the Control of Insurance Act number 25 of 1962 to carry on insurance business. Companies carrying on leasing business, factoring companies, companies registered under the companies, uh, company registered under the Finance Companies Act number 78 of 1988. Companies licensed under the Securities and Exchange Commission Act number 36 of 1987 to operate unit trust, fund management companies. Companies licensed under the Securities and Exchange Commission Act number 36 of 1987 to carry on business as stock brokers or stock dealers. Companies licensed under the Securities and Exchange Commission Act number 36 of 1987 to operate a stock exchange. Companies listed in a stock exchange licensed under the Securities and Exchange Commission Act number 36 of 1987. Public corporations engaged in the sale of goods or the provision of services. So, that entire list of enterprises do not ever fall under the category of being SME for which this SLFRS for SME does not apply in financial report, right. Then some exceptions are there. So, let me go to some important paragraphs here itself. <coughs> 1.6 paragraph number 1.6 and you can see it for yourself if you have the standard book with your a subsidiary whose parent uses full SLFRSs or that is part of a consolidated group that uses full SLFRSs is not prohibited from using the standard in its own financial statements if that subsidiary by itself does not have public accountability and those areas can be tested sometimes and you need to be aware. Now, we learn two sets of accounting standards. The massive one which we have been learning so far in that massive book will be called as full SLFRSs now. And the set of concise and simplified accounting standards we are going to learn in this book are called SLFRS for SME now. So, you need to be you need to keep a close eye how I use this, how I use my language. If I use the word full SLFRSs, I am referring to the list of big accounting standards we used to learn from that big book. And if I use the word SLFRS for SME, what I am referring to is the concise and the brief simplified versions of the same accounting standards applicable for SME. Now, say company A 
is the parent company which has a subsidiary company B. And A is a listed company and that has public accountability. So, A does not fall within the category of SME. But company B is a private limited and A has acquired company B in full. So, B does not have public accountability. Then B will fall under SME category and B can use the SLFRS for SME in preparing the financial statements, whereas the parent company does not fall into the category of B and SME. So, the parent company has to use the full SLFRS in preparing the financial statements. Then we have another problem at the stage of you starting to consolidate A and B together into a single entity. Why the financial statements prepared for company B are in accordance with SLFRS for SME, whereas the financial statements for the parent company are in accordance with full SLFRS and those two sets of financial statements are not compatible to each other, it is not going to be a perfect match now. So, that is all right, there is no issue. And company B just being a subsidiary company of another parent company which does not fall into the category of SME does not mean that company B will be prohibited from using SLFRS for SME in preparing their financial statements and they are permitted. But we have a small issue only at the point of the consolidation. What is it? These two set of accounts are not compatible to each other. So, you have to make them a perfect match. How do you make it a perfect match? Before you start doing the consolidation, the financial statements of company B, which are in accordance with SLFRS for SME, need to be translated and transformed back as into full SLFRSs and that is going to be another exercise. Once again, let me take the other way. Company B is a listed company and that does not fall into the category of SME. Company B is the subsidiary company, it is a listed company. So, this is not an SME. Whereas, the parent company is a private limited, private limited and falls under the category of SME. Now, just because the parent company has another subsidiary company which does not fall into the category of SME does not mean that the parent company will be prohibited from adopting SLFRS for SME for their individual financial statements. Company A, the parent company can use and adopt SLFRS for SME in their individual financial statements. And that is how you have to learn it in a group context, how SLFRS for SME can be used. So, it's, I, ho I hope things work as we can proceed and let us get on with the balance part. Now, I will give you an easy way to learn this. Most of the people, most of the students prefer shortcuts, but also you need to remember where there is a shortcut, there will be a short circuit as well. So, to be careful. Now, this small booklet contains almost all the accounting standards in a summarized and in a concise way and this is the simplified version of the all the accounting standards we learned before. So, for me to do a comprehensive work, I need to start explaining from LKS 1 even starting from the conceptual framework and continue and go on explaining right up to LKS 41 and then start explaining once again IFRS 1, SLFRS 1 right up to SLFRS 16, but that is not the way we should approach. What is it? And if you start doing that, it will take at least 20, 25 hours. So, we need to complete this within maximum 2 hours or maybe 3 hours. 
So, how can we do it? I will give you the way. Now, of the full SLFRSs, there are four accounting standards, four accounting standards that do not apply to SME at all. So, you need not to talk about those four accounting standards for SMEs, they do not apply at all, you need not to do them at all. So, there are, there are four accounting standards which do not apply to SME at all, so we can completely forget about it. So, you can remember it. If you want, you can buy hard no problem. Or if you want, you can just jot it in your SME book. What is it? We do not talk about SLFRS 5 for SME. SLFRS 5. So, what is SLFRS 5? Non current as it is held for sale and discontinued operations. You need not to apply that particular accounting prescriptions as far as SMEs are concerned. If you decide to sell an asset, we used to apply SLFRS 5 to recognize the assets held for sale and here you need not to do it and you need to apply the accounting simply, the disposal accounting at the point of the asset being disposed without you applying the accounting requirement of SLFRS 5. SLFRS 8, SLFRS 8 operating segments for other entities for which full SLFRS is applied, we also used to report on different segments, operating segments and reportable segments and so on and so forth. And that requirement is not there for SMEs. You need not to talk about separate, you need not to report on segments separately. And if you prepare a set of accounts, profit and loss and a balance sheet for the entire entity, that is what is needed without you separately reporting on different segments. Then you need not to talk about LK 33. LK 33 is what earnings per share? So, earnings per share calculations are not required for uh, SMEs. And LK 34, what is LK 34? Interim financial reporting is not required for SMEs. Now, sometimes for certain business enterprises, for various reasons, for various occasions, you need to prepare interim financial statements apart from you preparing financial, annual financial reporting. Maybe if you pay your taxes on quarterly basis, before you determine your tax obligations for a particular quarter, you need to prepare the profit and loss and the balance sheet for that particular quarter. So, that is what you mean by interim financial report. So, that requirement is not there for SME. So, these four standards do not apply for SME at all. Then, there are two accounting standards that apply as they are for SME as for other specified business enterprises. There are two accounting standards which apply for SME as they are without it being summarized, without it being simplified. There are two standards you need to remember. One is LKS 10, events occurring after the reporting period. Second LKS 37, provisions contingent assets and contingent liabilities. And if you find LKS 10, LKS 37 in, I mean, uh, those are the full accounting SLFRSs. The contents of full SLFRSs of LKS 10 and LKS 37 apply as they are without it being simplified for SME. Other accounting standards, there are simplifications. 
and the level of financial reporting has been simplified. And I must tell you, before that, why are the simplif simplifications required? The simplifications may be required because, as I said before, the financial reporting requirement of SMEs may not be as much as the financial reporting requirements of other specified business enterprises. The financial reporting requirements of SMEs are not so intense and that is one requirement, that is one reason why those accounting standards are simplified, I mean the accounting standards that apply for SMEs are of a simplified version. Sometimes to apply some of these full SLFRSs, you need to make some investment. I mean, it is not an investment, you need to incur a cost. The cost you incur for sometimes for SLF, I mean, for SMEs, the cost you incur in complying, in complying with full SLFRSs will outweigh the benefits. Now, say for a small example, if you have investment properties and if you decide to apply fair value model for investment properties to get the investment properties fair valued, you may have to incur like 500,000 rupees. But the fair value changes you incorporate into profit and loss will be a small amount like 100,000 rupees. So, the cost you incur in complying with full SLFRSs will outweigh the benefits you derive from complying with full SLFRSs. So, small and medium enterprises will not be able to afford to incur such a big amount of money for the compliance of SLFRSs. So, that is another reason why the set of accounting standards were further simplified in applying for SMEs. And their financial reporting requirements are minimal, maybe because they want to give it to the bank or maybe because they want to give it to Inland Revenue Department, that is it. And the shareholders or the directors themselves do not know what the financial reporting requirements are. They get their financial reporting done, they get their financial statements audited just because they know it is a legal requirement other than that they themselves do not have that requirement of getting the financial reporting done, getting the financial statements audited. And then, their understanding on the financial reporting also will be minimal and they do not know why deferred taxes are required, they do not know why research and development expenses may be required. So, you need not to apply the sophisticated, complicated financial reporting standards in preparing or in, in financial reporting for SMEs. So, those are the reasons why a simplified version is preferable for SME small guys without you giving them a heavy and a hectic, you know, cumbersome set of accounting standards for their financial reporting. Now, let us see the simplifications in the other accounting standards starting from right from the conceptual framework. Now, we learn in full SLFRS as the conceptual framework, conceptual framework. I am giving you only the exceptions, the areas where the exceptions are there. Now, we learn in the conceptual, you would have seen, would have watched our videos on conceptual frameworks, webinar videos. We do lot of things in the conceptual framework like the purpose of financial reporting, the qualitative characteristics, identify the reporting entity, recognition criteria and so on and so forth. You know the purpose of financial reporting seems to be the same 
and elements in the financial statement seem to be the same. The definitions of the elements in the financial statement seem to be the same. The way assets are defined, the way the liabilities are defined, the way income and expenses are defined, the way equity is defined, they all seem to be the same. But just one area where there are differences was qualitative characteristics. Now, under qualitative characteristics in the conceptual framework of full SLFR research, we basically had two categories of qualitative characteristics, fundamental and enhancing. enhancing. Under fundamental, we used to learn two characteristics, what were those? Faithful representations and relevancy. Under enhancing characteristics, we used to learn four basic, I mean four characteristics. Comparability, verifiability, timeliness and understandability. Now, this there is nothing called conceptual framework here, but they have given that in different section, this is section number 2, concepts and passive principles, pervasive principles, I made a mistake, section 2 concepts and pervasive principles, they have given us the qualitative characteristics, understandability, relevancy, materiality, reliability, substance over form, prudence, completeness, comparability, timeliness. Those are the characteristics which SLFRS for SME has given us. Now, let me take you there. Concepts and pervasive principles, objective of financial statements of small and medium sized entities, you will get the same stuff as in full SLFRSs, but this is where the differences lie. Understandability are the qualitative characteristics, I mean let me go through it for you all. Understandability, relevance, materiality, reliability, substance over form, prudence, completeness, comparability, timeliness. Those are the characteristics which the SLFRS for SME talks about. Then, let me take you to the section where complete set of financial statements are to spoken about. Now, in a set of financial statements, you know what the component should be. In a complete set of financial statements, you prepare profit and loss, other comprehensive income statement 
statement of financial position, statement of cash flows, and statement of equity changes and supplementary notes to financial statements. So, those are the components of financial statements. Now, we know even in full SLFRS, we have been given a choice either profit and loss statements and other comprehensive income statements can be merged together and it can be a single statement if you need. Or you can even have a choice of preparing the profit and loss statement being different from the statement of other comprehensive income. So, to make a long story short, either profit and loss and other comprehensive income statements can be different or it can be a single statement merged together. So, that choice is given in SLFRS for SME as well, so, but that is not what I want you to look at. Now, you prepare the statement of equity changes, you prepare the statement of equity changes as part of the financial reporting. Now, this page number Page number 29 says that a statement of equity changes may not be required. Now, you can show it in the profit and loss statement itself if this is 3.18 paragraph. If the only changes to equity during the periods for which financial statements are presented arising from profit or loss, payments of dividends, corrections of prior year, prior period errors and changes in accounting policy, the entity may present a single statement of income and retained earnings in place of the statement of comprehensive income and statement of changes in equity. If the only changes to equity during the period for which financial statements are presented arise from profit or loss, payments of dividends, corrections of prior period errors and changes in accounting policy, the entity may present a single statement of income and retained earnings in place of the statement of comprehensive income and statement of changes in equity. As you prepare the profit and loss, as you prepare the profit and loss, the profit and loss ends where profit after tax calculation is done. So, thereafter, from there on, it is the other comprehensive income statement that continues. Now, if you do not have equity changes other than the profit for the period, other than the dividend payments, other than the correction of prior period errors and changes in accounting policies. In other words, if you do not have any items of other comprehensive income, what you can do is here profit after tax and then without you preparing another statement for equity changes. If you do not have any other comprehensive income items and if you do not have any changes in the share capital, simply without you preparing another statement for equity changes, the profit and loss statements itself can be extended to include the other equity changes as a result of I mean other changes like dividend payments and changes of prior period errors, changes in accounting policies and so on and so forth. And please make sure you can do it without you having a separate statement for equity changes. The extension of the profit and loss can be used to show the retained profit changes, the dividend payments, the 
changes of the effects of changes of accounting policies and the correction of prior period errors only if you can make sure that there are no any other changes to it. So, I, I hope that part was clear. Then without you going for another statement, the profit and loss statement itself can be extended to incorporate the changes of retained earnings, the dividend payments here and the changes of accounting policies and the corrections of prior period errors and so on and so forth and then we can have the closing profit figure here. And you would have seen sometimes certain private limited companies which fall into this category of SME prepare their profit and loss with this retained earnings statement connected to the profit and loss itself that is because they do not have any other equity changes. Now, in other comprehensive income, in full SLFRSS as you learn other comprehensive income, you learn 5 items. What are these 5 items? Revaluation. gains of property plant and equipment and intangible assets, actuarial gains and losses, actuarial gains and losses. Then cash flow hedges, cash flow hedges. Then you have fair value changes, fair value changes of fair value through OCI financial assets. Then you have translation differences arising in translating foreign operations into the presentation currency. So, those are the 5 items that will come under other comprehensive income according to full SLFRS. But remember, even if you prepare the other comprehensive income statement, there can be only maximum 4 items. What are the 4 items? Revaluation Re of property, plant and equipment can be there. Revaluations Re of intangible assets cannot be there, it can be only revaluation Re gains of property, plant and equipment. Why there will not be revaluations Re gains of intangible assets will be discussed in a little while. Actuarial gains and losses will be there, cash flow hedges will be there. Translation differences in translating foreign operations into the presentation currencies will be there. So, what is missing there? is the fair value changes of fair value through OCI financial assets. So, that part does not appear if you prepare other comprehensive income statement for SMEs. Now, in page number 38, you get the items to be taken under other comprehensive income. Four types of other comprehensive income are recognized as part of total comprehensive income outside of profit or loss when they arise, some gains and losses arising on translating the foreign, uh, translating the financial statements of a foreign operations into the presentation currency, some actuarial gains and losses, some changes in fair values of hedging instruments and changes in the revaluation surplus of property, plant and equipment measured in accordance with the revaluation model. Right. So, that is what I explained just a while ago and let us further look at the simplifications of other remaining accounting standards.
then we will go to section number 9. Consolidated and separate financial statements. Right. <coughs> Consolidated financial statements in full SLFR SSB learn it under SLFR is 10. SLFR is 10. It is a massive and a very philosophical accounting standards which you need to do ins and outs to get a comprehensive understanding. Now, we have studied there a parent company will not be exempted from the requirement of preparing consolidated financial statements with a subsidiary company just on the basis of the business of the subsidiary company being different from the business of the parent company. Now, say for an example, if company A is the parent and company B is the subsidiary company, company A is a software develop, developing company and company B is just pumping air to the parachutes and balloons, two different business enterprises. And company A will decide look here what is the use of consolidating the financial statements of company B with those of company A, why it is meaningless ultimately eventually why. They are business activities of pumping air to the parachutes and balloons have got nothing to do with our business of developing softwares. Come on. SLFRS 10 does not grant and sanction the permission of a subsidiary company from being consolidated just on the basis of the business of the subsidiary company being different from the business of the parent company and vice versa. Even if the two business activities are completely totally different, still you have got to prepare consolidated financial statements consolidating all the members within the group. And if the parent company has a massive profit of 2 billion and the subsidiary company's performances are really negative and they have a massive loss, thundering loss of 5 billion rupees, just by consolidating the financial statements of company B with those of company A, what happens is the profit that the parent company has reported will be engulfed into the loss of the subsidiary company. So, the parent company say look here no point of consolidating. Once again the parent company will not be given the permission and the sanction to wait without consolidating a subsidiary company just on the basis of subsidiary companies results are negative and the parent companies results are positive. It is not still parent company has to prepare consolidated financial statements including all the members and the subsidiary companies within the group. And SLFRS 10 has given this exemption of not preparing consolidated financial statements only at few ex instances and the first is given after fulfilling four requirements and let me just remind you the four requirements just still in SLFRS 10 and let me come back to these sections in a just a little while. A parent company will be <coughs> given the permission will be exempted from the requirement of preparing consolidated financial statements if and only if four requirements are satisfied, what is it? The parent company itself is a fully or a partially owned subsidiary company of another parent. Say company B has company C and company D. In return company B has been a subsidiary company of company as I am talking about company B now. Company B will be given this permission and the sanction if company B will 
speak to and report and notify to all the shareholders even including the shareholders who can't vote at the meetings. The fact that company B is not going to prepare consolidated financial statements including C and D and nobody objects, nobody objects. If at least one shareholder insist on consolidated financial statements, company B has to prepare consolidated financial statements. And then company B should not be a listed entity and the next one company B should not be in the process of being listed. The last one the ultimate parent company should take over to prepare the consolidated financial statements including company B and company C and company D and then all the company B will be exempted from the requirement of preparing consolidated financial statements including two subsidiary companies or C and D. There are four, not that I told, I just reminded you all what you learnt from SLFR state. Now, here that exemption also has been further simplified. If you just go through 9.3, a parent need not to present consolidated financial statements if both of the following conditions are met. So, SLFR is 10 has given four requirements. Here, the section 9 relating to consolidated financial statements gives only two requirements to be satisfied for a parent company to be exempted from the requirement of preparing consolidated financial statements. So, what are these two? The parent itself is a subsidiary company, okay. the ultimate parent company produces consolidated financial statements, produces consolidated general purpose financial statements that comply with full SLFRSS or with the stand. Those two only so you need to keep those areas highlighted. So, then if a particular question is given you can straight away turn to the pages where those uh, the, the simplifications are given and you can easily and quickly give the required answers to the examiner at the exam. Then we are moving on to another important section. This is section number 11, basic financial instruments. Let us go to paragraph number 14. Now, the SLFRS for SME has to be revised to incorporate the latest, latest updations, latest revisions of SLFRS like SLFRS 9 is not here, SLFRS 15 is not here, SLFRS 16 is not here and they talk about LK 39, right. Financial instruments and we will first talk about financial assets. So, under SLFRS 9, we have three categories of financial assets. 
fair value through profit and loss, fair value through OCI and financial assets measured at amortized cost, measured at amortized cost, right. Now, what and what financial assets are categorized under each of these three that is in accordance with SLFRS 9. Here, any financial asset acquired for trading purpose can be under fair value through profit and loss. Derivatives can be under fair value through profit and loss. Here, fair value through OCI investments in equity in, uh, items of other companies not for trading purpose will be under fair value through OCI or investments in debt instruments of other companies where the objectives of the business model were to collect both contractual cash flows and the sales proceeds should be under fair value through OCI. And the measured at amortized cost is the category where the investments in debt instruments whose business model is to collect only the contractual cash flows are classified. Now, just imagine an investor say APLC acquiring the shares of a company, non-listed company, say B limited, it is not a listed company. B limit. And obviously, if it is not listed, if the investee is not listed, the investor would not have acquired the shares for trading purpose. If it is not listed, you cannot easily trade. So, any rational investor would not ever acquire the shares of a non listed company for trading purpose. If it is not for trading purpose, it has to be under this category fair value through OCI. So, what are the initial and subsequent measurement requirements under fair value through OCI? Initial and subsequent measurement have to be fair value. Then for the fair value measurement, you cannot pick the fair value from a readily available price as quoted prices from an active market and this is kind of an investment for which an active market does not exist. So, then using various techniques and inputs, they need to get the fair value done, may be sometimes they have to get another valuer to do a fair independent valuation of the shares which will cost to the company sometimes. And we know these small and medium enterprise enterprises can not afford to incur heavy expenses in compliance with SLFRSs. So, that is one reason why the standards were simplified in this SLFRS for SME. So, as a result, basically we have only two kinds of financial assets for SME. What are these two kinds? Base it can there can be fair value through I mean uh, three categories. Basically, there can be only two. What are these two? fair value through profit and loss and fair value uh, fair value through profit and loss and measured at amortized cost. Now, any debt instrument can be classified under measured at amortized cost no issue. Any debt instrument can be classified under amortized cost. Investments of equity shares or investments in debt instruments acquired for trading purpose for which active markets do exist from which fair values can be determined with undue cost and effort can be categorized under fair value through profit and loss. And if they acquire shares or debt instruments for which fair values do not exist fair values do not exist in an active market, quoted prices are not available in an active market for certain investments, then those investments will be carried initially uh, at transaction price and later at the cost. So, the fair value requirements are not there then. Fair value requirements arise only if an investment was done or the fair value requirements will arise where there is an active market 
where the quoted prices can be readily can be readily obtained from and then the fair value requirements are. I hope you got the point. Let me summarize it if it is like confusing. Here, if they make investments for which fair values exist and or uh, active markets exist, active markets active markets exist for from which fair values can be derived can be derived then those investments will be carried at fair value initial measurement will be at the transaction cost i mean uh, the purchase price at the transaction pri price initial measurement is at the transaction price subsequent measurement will be the fair value and this is an investment for which active markets do exist from which the fair values can be derived so no issue because you can de uh, determine the fair values with undue cost and effort if it is an investment in equity items or debt instruments, especially equity items, if it is an investment in equity items for which active markets do not exist, do not exist and fair values cannot be determined with undue cost and effort, initial measurement should be at the transaction price and subsequent measurement should be the cost. And if you make investments in debt instruments of companies, most of the debt instruments can be under amortized cost and we can calc or we can initially recognize and measure them at the transaction price, subsequent measurement should be amortized cost uh, used in the effective interest rate. So, that is how the financial instruments been simplified in SLFRS for SME. So, we have maximum uh, you know, two items of financial assets depending on whether the fair values can be determined with undue cost or effort and most of the financial assets then will be measured at uh, amortized cost, amortized cost if you can determine the fair value with undue cost and fair value, undue cost and effort, undue cost and effort then we can uh, recognize them at fair value. And if it is an equity investment for which active markets do not exist and you can determine the fair value with undue cost and effort, then you initially measure them at the transaction price and subsequently at the cost. So, that is how it was summarized and let us move on. investments in associates and joint ventures so slfrs for sme has devoted two sections for this uh, for these two they separate to discuss investments in associates and separately talk about investments in joint ventures. 
since the accounting treatments are the same, so let me merge them together and to discuss once and for all. We will go to section 14. In Fuller's LFR research, we have LKS 28 and LKS 28 defines what an associate company is and those the same definitions are given here as well. An associate is an entity where the investor can exert and exercise significant influence, not the control. How does LKS 28 define what the significant influences are? It is the ability or the power to participate in the operating and financial policy decision making process, it is not the control. The same stuff is here in SLFR for SME as well. Now, LKS 28 investments for associates and joint ventures stipulate that we need to apply equity method, equity method to recognize associates and joint ventures into the financial statements of the investor, equity method and equity method you need to recognize investment at cost initially and all subsequent equity changes are recognized and adjusted to the investment account itself and there are some other requirements. Now, what are the Simplifications given in SLFRS for SME. SLFRS for SME says that an associate company can be recognized into the financial statements of the investor using three methods. What are these three methods? Either you can use the cost or you can use equity method as we studied before equity method also can be used equity method or fair value model fair value fair value now, once again fair value model can be used only if the fair value can be used can, can be determined with undue cost and effort If the cost model is used, you recognize the investment at cost, investment at cost and that is what that will continue to appear in the financial statements all along. Subsequent equity changes will not be incorporated and the dividends that the investor receives from the associate company will be recognized as income to the profit and loss irrespective of whether the dividends were received from the pre acquisition profit or post acquisition profits. Equity method you know it and that is what you learnt under LK 28. So, I will not repeat it again and I must tell you one small point on the equity method. Investments are initially recognized at cost subsequent equity changes are adjusted and incorporated to the investment account itself and the dividends received should be adjusted and recognized as a recovery of the investment. And the fair value, this is basically has the connectivity with financial instruments and if you recognize it under fair value model, it is like you recognizing it under fair value through OCI category. I mean, it is a financial asset, initial measurement is the transaction price, subsequent measurement will be fair value, subsequent measurement should be the fair value, if it is categorized under fair value category, fair value method.
initial measurement is the transaction price and the subsequent measurement is fair value and it since under fair value model fair value changes should be recognized to profit and loss. It is like you recognizing it as a financial instrument and we have the same accounting for financial instruments under SLFRS for SME. Then we will go to section 17 investment property. Section 16 Investment Property Now the correspondent accounting standards under SLFRS should be LK Sport Investment Property and you know what investment properties are. Investment property should be land or buildings held for the purpose of generating the rental income or capital appreciations, not for use in the manufacturing of goods and services, administration purposes or distribution purposes. Now, what is uh, important here is not the definition of investment properties and uh, what makes it look different from LKS 40 and that is what is needed here. Investment properties are initially measured at cost, initially measured at cost and you know how the cost is determined and this is not a forum to discuss that part. And LKS 40 proposes two accounting treatments or gives two subsequent measurements for investment properties either you can use cost model or you can use fair value model, fair value model. Now, the cost model is discussed not in LKS 40, cost model is discussed in LKS 16 property plant and equipment. Similarly, here the cost model is discussed not in section 16 investment property, cost model is discussed in LKS 17, I made a mistake, section 17 cost model is discussed in section 17 which is property plant and equipment that is the section devoted for property plant and equipment. So, do not get, get confused. Now, cost model is the method where investment properties will be shown at historical cost minus cumulative depreciation determined on the basis of the historical cost. Fair value model is the model where investment properties are initially measured at cost and subsequent measurement will be the market value fair value. Fair value changes are recognized to profit and loss and investment properties carried at fair value will not be depreciated. So, the entire meaning has to be impregnated into this concept of fair value model that just two words will include and impregnate the entire meaning of investment properties been initially measured at cost and subsequently been measured at fair value, fair value changes been recognized to profit and loss and investment properties carried at fair value not being depreciated. But once again, you know sometimes to get the fair valuations done, you need to spend 
you need to spend some amount of money and this fair valuation process can be a little expensive exercise and that need some efforts that need to go into that it is cumbersome and tiring exercise sometimes which small guys like SME cannot afford to do and they cannot afford to spend that amount of money to comply with the requirement of fair value model sometimes and they cannot spend their valuable time to get that fair valuations done. So, as a result L, uh, I mean section 16 of SLFRS for SME says fair value model can be used for subsequent measurement only where the fair value can be determined with undue cost and effort. If it is less cost, if it is less expensive and if it is effortless then it does not mind you applying fair value model for investment properties. If it requires some cost to be incurred, if it becomes tiring and if it requires some effort to be made to determine the fair value, so you might as well to use the cost model not the fair value model. I hope you got it. Fair value model for investment properties can be used where fair value can be determined with undue cost and effort. So, th those are important and you need to keep those areas highlighted so that at the exam you can straight away retrieve the required accounting treatments from the standard book. Then the same uh, LK, I mean the section 17 that is the section devoted for property plant and equipment. The corresponding SLFRS has to be LK 16. Now, as per case 16 property plant and equipment in full SLFRSS and you cannot make a choice of the depreciation method just for the sake of doing. Why the depreciation method you select has to reflect how the entity expects to consume the economic benefits from this asset. The depreciation method you choose has to reflect how the entity expects to consume the economic benefits of the asset to the entity. Now, if there will be changes in the expectations of how the entity consumes economic benefits in the future, you need to transform from the current depreciation method to another different depreciation method. Now, if you decide to consume the economic benefits of an asset evenly over the lifetime, the straight line depreciation method will be preferable to the other depreciation method. But later on, 
the entity decided to consume the economic benefits of the asset in a reducing balance method or like it keeps reducing the way the entity expects to uh, consume economic benefits from the assets will keep reducing from year on year then you need to shift from the straight line depreciation method to the reducing balance method. So, no longer can we apply a straight line depreciation method. Similarly, there can be circumstances where changes will be required to useful lifetime and changes also will be revisions will be required to residual value. So, under LK 16 property plant and equipment at least you need to review them annually to see whether revisions are required. If the revisions are required, you need to do the changes as per case 10. I made a mistake as per case 8. Now, LK 16 makes it mandatory to review them to see whether changes are required to the useful lifetime residual value and depreciation method at least annually. More frequent the better at least annually. It cannot be once in two years. It has, it has to be at least annually. More frequent, more often the better. Now, SLFRS for SME does not make it mandatory to review them annually. You can do the changes. You can revise them depreciation method used for life and residual value when there are indications that the revisions are required for them. If there are indications showing that, if there are indications showing that revisions are required to the depreciation method, revisions are required to useful life, revisions are required to residual value, then only you need to review them. So, that is another exception in SLFRS for SME. Let us go to intangible assets. This is section 18, intangible assets other than goodwill. Paragraph 18.14. Uh, now, the correspondent SLFRS for intangible assets should be L case 38. L case 38. And much emphasis has been placed by LK 38 on intangibles arising within the business. We used to call them internally generated intangible assets. They are you discussed research cost and development cost. Research cost and development cost. Now, L case 38 always recommended research cost being expensed immediately for the period during which it was incurred and never can it be an intangible asset research cost. However, development cost can be an internally generated intangible asset if six requirements were satisfied. What were the six requirements? You need to make sure that the adequate resources will be available to start in a commercial production. I have just given you the criteria without explaining and make sure that you have the ability to sell and manufacture. Make sure that you have the intention to start the production in a commercial scale. 
make sure that you can demonstrate how this product or uh, the development cost of the new product will generate economic benefits either by demonstrating or showing an external market or internal use and make sure the cost can be measured reliably and they are all together 6. Now, section 18 of SLFRS for SME intangible assets says whether it is research cost or the development cost that does not make a difference both research cost and development cost indiscriminately should be expensed to profit and loss for the period during which they were incurred. Now, you need not to look at the six criteria to recognize development cost and intangible assets even the development cost can never be intangible asset and just slam it to profit and loss and recognize it as an expenditure and deduct it from the current year profit under SLFRS for SME never development cost never does development cost become internally generated intangible assets and that is important. Then LK 38 has given two subsequent measurement uh, methods for intangible assets. Either we can use the cost model or we can use revaluation model, but still LK 38 said revaluation model for subsequent measurement of intangibles can be used only for the intangibles for which active markets do exist. But section 18 and the SLFRS for SME does not require revaluation model to be used for the subsequent measurement of intangibles and you can apply only the cost model for the subsequent measurement of intangibles revaluation models cannot be used. Then we will go to the next section 19 and page number, let us see the page number, here the page numbers are little different. This is business combinations and goodwill, this is similar to SLFRS 3. Paragraph number 19.23. Right. Now, what does SLFRS 3 prescribe for the goodwill? Goodwill has to be an asset, more precisely, it has to be a non current asset. And that is something similar to be like an intangible asset, it is not dealt under LK 38, though it is under SLFRS 3 and it is not amortized ever, there are reasons why it cannot be amortized. Instead, what are we supposed to do? The goodwill has to be kind of non-current assets which has to be tested for impairment annually. Without it being amortized, you need to conduct impairment reviews for the goodwill arising in the business combinations annually. And that requirement has further been simplified in SLFRS for SME. If the goodwill is arising in a business combinations like in a consolidation, what you must do is not to test it for impairment annually, you need to go on amortizing that goodwill. What is the lifetime? Lifetime cannot exceed 10 years period. The maximum period during which the goodwill arising in a consolidation question can be amortized should be 10 years and it has to be either 10 years or less than 10 years period. So, that is the accounting simplification for the goodwill in a business combinations, the goodwill cannot be 
need not to be tested for impairment and will instead you need to amortize the goodwill over a period not exceeding 10 years time. So, that is paragraph number 19.23, just keep it highlighted and that is important at the exam. Then section 24 government grants. The correspondent SLFRS was LKS 20. Under LKS 20 we had asset related granted and income related granted and asset related granted we had two approaches capital approach and revenue approach and this is to recognize the government grants outside the profit and loss and this is to recognize the grant within the profit and loss. Under the capital approach what you did was you recognize the related asset and the grant was recognized into a reserve. Under revenue approaches, we had again two methods, either to recognize the grant under deferred revenue or to recognize the grant as a deduction from the value of the asset. And that rigmarole is no longer available in SLFRS for SM, it has, be, has been further simplified. Let us see what the simplifications are. This is LKS. Uh, this is uh, section 24 of SLFRS for SME. These are the accounting simplifications for government grant, a grant that does not impose specified future performance conditions on the recipient is recognized income when the grant proceeds are receivable. You know sometimes grants are given on requiring the entities to meet certain specifications and if no specifications, no requirements were given. We unconditionally the grant has been given, then you need to bring them to profit and loss straight. Second, a grant that imposes specified future performance conditions on the recipient is recognized income only when the performance conditions are met. Third, grants received before the revenue recognition criteria are satisfied are recognized as a liability. So, then those are the simplifications of grants in uh, section 24. Then section 25, borrowing cost. You know the relevant correspondent accounting standard was LKS 23 and LKS 23 we had two accounting principles treatments. Borrowing cost incurred on qualifying asset should be capitalized added to the carrying value of the asset. Other borrowing cost should be expensed immediately. And now this section 20, uh, 25 borrowing cost says whether it is borrowing cost incurred on qualifying assets so any other borrowing cost indiscriminately should be expensed to profit and loss and you need not to add them to the carrying values of the assets. Then section 26 this is share based payment uh, transactions. Now, in share based payment transactions, we have equity settled share based payments and cash settled share based payment transactions. If it is equity settled share based payment transactions, sometimes you need to take the fair values of equity items if it is transaction or receiving services from the employees. If it is 
and equity settlers share based payment transaction or receiving services from the employees you need to decide the fair values of the equity items why that is how you value the transaction. For SMEs this can be cumbersome and tiring and expensive. Then SLFRS for SMEs is the fair values of equity items for this requirement can be estimated by using the judgments of the directors and based on their judgments, based on their assessments, the fair values can be determined has been further simplified. Then employee benefits, employee benefits, you have defined benefit plans which require actuarial valuations. One method of actuarial valuations will be projected unit credit method and projected unit credit method can be used if it is less expensive and that requires less effort. If not, they can go to another simplified valuation methods and that has been simplified further. So, those are the simplifications of SLFRS for SMEs and we have done everything you need to keep them highlighted and go through the book once again, see where those simplifications are so that you can retrieve the required sections easily at the exam and thanks for watching our videos on SLFRS for SME.